Lord. We're in our study on apostasy in the book of Jude. I hope that you're keeping up. Your reading assignments are very short. Two or three verses a week, I think you can get it down. Amen. But it's good to see you. This series on apostasy is one that obviously I think is relevant to the day and the age and the current times that we're in, probably more so than ever, ever before. There's a lot of signs concerning the end times and the last days and as we get into a different series on prophecy, we'll look at some of those things. But one of the greatest signs throughout Scripture for those last days is when apostasy, this rejection of the truth, uh, just comes to an apex, when it's at its zenith. And I believe we're getting to those days at this point in time. We're going to look at three verses from the book of Jude. If you don't know where it is, it's right before the book of Revelation, which is the last book. And we've gone through verses 1, 2, 3, and 4 the last couple of weeks. Today we're going to be looking at verses 5, 6, and 7. But we're going to really cover some ground. It took us two weeks to get four verses. Now we're really moving forward. So you have to listen fast. Amen? But uh, as we get into the book of Jude, let's see how this, if everything's functional. I desire to remind you, though, you know all these things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their own dominion but abandoned their proper abode... He has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. I guess we're going to catch up here. And just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they are in the same way as these, indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Now, these are some illustrations of apostasy that he's talking about. We're going to look a little bit closer at those things in just a moment. But remember, as we talk and discuss this issue, apostasy is the abandonment and the rejection of truth. It's people who have known the truth and heard the truth, have an intellectual uh, kind of a handle on the truth, but yet in their life, in their walk, they don't really believe the truth. And there's a lot of things in scriptures that talk about those things. Jesus even says, you know, in John... On that last day, many will stand before me, and many will call me Lord, and I will say unto them, Depart from me, you work of iniquity. I never knew you. That's the apostates. Those are the people who really had never had a relation. Matthew 24, verse, uh, verses 10 says, And at that time, talk about the end times, Jesus said, Many will fall away, and they will betray one another, and they'll hate one another, and many false prophets will rise and mislead many. In other words, the day is coming right before the end time, right to show that we are in the end times with this great rejection of truth and this great moving away from the truth. And I believe that's certainly where we are in our world today. Ultimately, it's, it's, it's a, apostasy is a series of denials of the truth of God's word. One, it denies ultimately the, the power of God. It says the apostate will hold a form of godliness. I mean, they look religious and spiritual and Christian, you know, and they speak Christianese, say all the right things, but yet they, re, they, they ignore and they reject the power of God that really leads to genuine godliness. Uh, they reject ultimately the Lord Jesus himself. Peter said they'll deny the Lord that brought them. It denies the return of Christ. Peter also talked about the apostates when he said in the last days, there, you know, there are going to be scoffers saying, where is the sign of his coming? Uh, in 1 Timothy 4, it talks about how they'll reject the faith. We talked about the faith in our first uh, two lessons about what is the faith. It's not just a faith or any faith. It is the faith, the message of the Word of God, the message of the gospel. In 1 Timothy, or 2 Timothy 4, 1, it talks about in the last days they'll, that they'll reject a sound doctrine and follow false teachers and people who will take the truth of God and turn it into fables. They'll tell you that the Bible doesn't mean what it really says. It means this. We just don't understand it. And on and on it go. It says in the last days they'll be lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. So they'll, they'll reject, you know, a separate, committed Christian living for just doing whatever they want to do under the guise of grace. Uh, they reject... Uh, Christian freedoms, they'll revert to legalism and, and, and religion and things like that, Peter went on to say. They reject biblical authority. So as he talks about apostasy, Jude now moves to the point where giving us three illustrations. Remember he said there, there are people who just reject truth. They don't want the word of God. They don't want the will of God for their life. They don't mind talking about God and appearing to be spiritual. And he gives these three illustrations, and he does it in a unique way when he lays them out. And he talks about, you know, there are some people, these three groups that illustrate apostates 
and also illustrate the attitude that God has towards people who would reject ultimately the truth of God. In fact, Jude gets down to this. It is a book of warning. He's telling them, don't be like this. And you remember how the first two verses, he talked about, if you know Jesus, there's the security that is yours in Christ if you really know him. But Paul went on to say, and Peter also said, make your calling and election sure. Paul said, examine yourself to see that you're in the faith. So if you are the genuine article, you don't have to be afraid, but you need to know what's coming on and what's happening around you, lest you should be confused. So Jude Ford, he described those ungodly men in 5 and 6 and 7. He talks about some groups that fall into that. And he talks about so these three groups. And this is our message today to give you these illustrations and what they mean because there may be something about these verses that seems a, a bit strange to you. Now, the Jews is the first illustration he uses, and he's reminding them, as Peter does. Peter uses that word a lot when he says, you know, I want to remind you. He said, I want to be ready to remind you of the things, even though you already know them. You've been established in the truth which is present with you. I consider it right as long as I'm in this earthly body, in this earthly dwelling, to stir you up by way of reminder. What's Peter saying? He says, don't forget, don't forget. And he's specifically talking, don't forget what happened to the Jews. And he's talking specifically about that group that left Egypt in the Exodus. This is probably the most well-loved story, the most remembered story among all Jews. And so it's amazing. He said, don't forget, don't forget the important parts of that story. Don't forget the important ingredients of what was happening there and what really did happen, how that God delivered them but, and delivered them supernaturally and he delivered them by, by miraculous acts. I mean, there were miracles that took place, the, the plagues of Egypt, the, the, uh, the departure of the Red Sea and how they, they went through it and how it rolled back on both sides and the plagues that, that were left behind and the, the promises that were before them, miracle after miracle. He's saying, you know, don't forget. And you say, if anybody wouldn't forget, certainly these people wouldn't forget it. But Peter says, I want to stir your mind up again in 2 Peter in verse 15. I will endeavor that you may be able after my decease. In other words, when I go on to be with Jesus, I want you to have these things in remembrance. Don't forget what I'm telling you. Don't forget the history. Don't, you know, we, what we say about history, we learn that history teaches us we learn nothing from history. And this is exactly what Peter's warning them against. Be, be mindful of what has taken place in the past. See how God operated then. See what God's going to do now. We talked about the immutability of God, remember, that God is never changing. He is always the same. He, you know, he doesn't vacillate and change his opinion and change, you know, he's God, he's an eternal God and his mind is made up and his ways and his character are set in all eternity. He is who he is. And so Peter said, I, I want to remind you. In fact, he, he goes on another place in another chapter uh, later. He says, this is the second epistle, beloved, but I now write unto you in both which, both epistles, both letters. He says, I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Don't forget. Don't forget. Don't forget what? Don't forget what happened. Don't forget how God dealt with in, in the Old Testament, how he dealt with his people. Don't forget. You, you know these things well. The greatest story in Jewish history. They knew it well, but he said, don't forget. In fact, there's two things he wanted them to remember. One, God delivered them, but he destroyed those that didn't believe. The book of Hebrews it gives reference to that when in Hebrews chapter 3 says, listen, as the Holy Ghost says today, if you will hear his voice, Harden not your hearts as in provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness when your fathers tempted me, proved me, saw my works 40 years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation said they do always err in their hearts and they have not known my ways. They've seen miracle after miracle, yet they did not believe. They saw the power of God. They saw the works of God. They saw the mighty acts of God, but yet they continued to reject the truth of God. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, you know, you know, if the Spirit of God speaks to you, you do not harden your heart, you respond to the Spirit of God. Many theologians believe that the context of the book of Hebrews was primarily written to Jews who were kind of on the fence about this thing of Christianity. Though they were, they were there in the church, but there were many within the church who just really hadn't made their mind up all the way. And he says, don't, don't be that way. In fact, Numbers 14, it says, because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, tempted me now ten times, have not hearkened to my voice. Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto the fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. 
It's interesting. He uses this word provocation in Hebrews. He uses it in the New Testament a couple of places. He also uses the word provocation and provoking in the Old Testament. He says, don't be like those people who provoked me. What was, the, what was provoking to God? What was provoking to God is he had done everything miraculously in their presence to bear witness that his word was true, but yet even though they saw it and saw it and saw it, they didn't believe it. They backed off. They gave up. And it says, literally, they provoked God. And that provoke, a, I heard a really good illustration about what that word means in the Hebrew context there, is to provoke, and that particular word has to do with rubbing something the wrong way, in, in, in the, or rubbing something that's raw, in, in a raw place. In other words, if you had a blister on your hand, we've probably all gotten blisters from doing work or whatever, and, you know, manual labor, some of y'all still do that. You know, that, and you get this big blister and it swells up and it's all red and it starts, pus starts filling in it. Boy, anytime you touch it, it's just, you know, it hurts. Oh man, it's just painful. And then for you to have to use it again or have that thing break, you know, I'll I try not to explain it too much more. Most of you are grimacing already. You, you know what that's like. This is what it means to provoke, to take and rub it in this manner. God said, you don't, don't provoke, the, the writer is saying, don't provoke God. You know what's right, why do what's wrong? You know the truth, why are you rejecting the truth? And so he's writing them saying, don't put this off. You know, uh, it's, it, it's not going to profit you, all these miracles of God, all the word of God, all the grace of God, if you don't believe it, if you don't put your faith in it. Hebrews said, you know, th this promise remains of entering in his rest, and he's using the illustration in the Old Testament. He said, you know, we had good news preached to us, just like they did, but the word they heard did not profit them because it was not united or it was not mixed with faith by those who heard it. In other words, it's one thing to know the truth, it's another thing to believe the truth. You, you've heard it said many times, a lot of people are going to miss heaven by 18 inches. The distance from their head to their heart. In other words, they got the information, it's come in, they've got the intellectual understanding of what the Bible says, but they don't believe it. They don't put their faith in it. Oh, they say they do. They go through the motions, and this is the apostate, someone who externally exhibits some things, but inwardly they have not really made a commitment to follow Jesus Christ. And he's warning against it. He said, don't be like those people. You have the history of those people. You saw what happened to them. They died in the wilderness because they wouldn't believe God. Don't be like that. But you know, there's, there's a lot of people in churches today who fit this bill right down the mark who've never really made the commitment of their heart and their life because they've never taken the word of God and, said, and, and mixed it with faith. A faith that says, I choose to receive and I choose to believe God. And they turn their back. They just go away. Now, I'm not talking about, we covered this already, so I'm not going to deal with this in length. I'm not talking about just a backslider, someone who, you know, just goes away from the Lord for a while. But he's talking about somebody who departs from the faith. And there's a lot of things that cause people to, to depart and, and turn away. And I'll list some of them here. I won't go through the details of a lot of them. But obviously persecution. It's not popular. You're not accepted. People laugh at you. People mock you. People scorn you. So I, I'm not going to do that. That's just too tough. And, and then there's false teachers. The Bible talks about don't give heed to false teachers. They're going to turn your hearts away. It's part of the, the apostate movement. They're going to lie to you. And they're going to tell you what you want to hear. Just so they can be popular. So they can take a, collect a check. So they can be, so they'll just say anything just to, to be accepted. And then the Bible even talks about some people turn away because of the testings from the Word of God. That's in the parable of Jesus found in the Gospel. When he talks about some seed fell on the shallow ground and it couldn't develop a root, therefore, when the sun came up and scorched it, that it died. If there's no root system, if there's nothing underneath, then you can't. Get what you need to survive, nutrients, water, you know, the, the things that, that the root system does for the plant. Say, so, but this plant is all about the surface. It's nothing underneath, so when the sun comes up, it just, it just dies away. That's a picture of the apostate. Jesus explained that parable in the same chapter in Matthew 13, and he says, the sun that comes up is the word of God. It is the tribulation from the word of God that offends them. In other words, when God's... They begin to understand that God wants them to be a disciple, forsake their old life, follow Jesus as the Lord of their new life. They don't want to do that. They, I just want to do my own thing, you know. Uh, uh, that was me in my life. You know, I, as a teenager, I believed all those things about the Bible. Jesus died for my sins, rose from the dead. You know, I, I kind of had a grip on all that. But when it really came down to it, I didn't want anybody telling me what to do. Even God. I was going to do 
what I wanted to do. And by the way, for those who kind of embrace that philosophy of life, that's what the Bible basically describes the word sin as. You know, just doing what you want to do, going your own way, living your own life. So if you say, well, I haven't robbed any banks or killed anybody, that's some sins, but that's the essence of it is just self-will and self-direction. And so they, they see that and, and they don't want to do it. And we all even talked about worldly temptations. You know, Paul talked about his friend Demas who traveled with him. And in 2 Timothy, he said, listen, Demas has forsaken me having loved this present world. In other words, Demas was more in love with what the world offered than what God would offer him. And then there's neglect. We read those verses. Don't, they hear the word of God, but they just don't do anything about it. And then hardened hearts. In fact, by, by the way, the more you neglect it, the harder the heart has a tendency to get. So that's why it's important. The Bible says, today if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. But listen to what he has to say. Religion, people, you know, it's kind of like getting a vaccination. You know, when you get a polio vaccination, they, they give you a little bit of polio is basically what they do. You get just enough of the real thing, you know, to inoculate it from when the bigger version of it. And that's the way religion does. It kind of gives you, just inoculates you against the real thing uh, of Jesus and life and reality and Christian power in your life. And then even forsaking the fellowship of the saints. The Bible talks about in Hebrews. If when you do that, you, you need to be around people who are going to encourage you and, and uh, hold you accountable and, and pray for you and lift you up and love you. You need to be around the saints of God. But, but if you know the gospel, basically, and you turn your back on it, then that's pretty much a character of what an apostate is. Apostate's not somebody who's, who doesn't know the gospel, not familiar with the gospel. It's people who know the gospel. He said, the Jews were like that. They knew the word of God. The promise was before them. They'd seen the testimony that God had given them. But not everybody went in, only those that believed. The rest were left to destruction. You see... The path to salvation has not changed from Genesis to Revelation. The path to God and the path to salvation and the grace of God has always been through faith in the grace of God, through faith in the Word of God, through faith in God Himself. I put my trust. I don't look to my works. I don't look to my religion. I don't look to my ability, my personality, my wit, my charm, my great talent. Nothing. I only look to Jesus. Only Christ can save us. Only God can change us. And it, so we look to Him. Any other way is to miss the mark completely. Then he talks about another group here, the angels. And this might seem a little bizarre when you read it. It says, and the, the apostates are like the angels who did not keep their own domain, but they abandoned their proper abode, and he has kept them in eternal bonds under darkness for judgment of the great day. In other words, he says, just as the Jews chose against God when they knew the truth, there are angels who absolutely chose against God. In this case you don't know, this whole issue of going to hell, you know, people say, I can't believe God would send anybody to hell. It's not about God sending, it's about you choosing. All right? So don't, don't miss the mark there. We, we have, as the apostate, we have offered to us is life. Offered to us is light. And if I choose to respond to that light, it will lead me to Jesus. It will lead me to God. It will lead me to a sacrifice for my sins. And I can escape that judgment. All right? So it, it, a lot of people put these things, well, God did this. Well, listen, I think you need to wake up and see you have a choice to make in your life. And God, as he did the angels, gave them this ability to make a choice. And these angels chose against God. So if you look at these, you kind of, well, who are these angels and what are their sins, you know? Uh, what, what's, what's going on with these guys? Well, there's basically three views about these angels. And some people say, well, we don't know anything about you. So don't deal with this verse. Don't talk about this verse. Don't worry about this verse. We just don't know anything about those angels. But Jude says in verse 5, I want to remind you. <laughs> so it's something that apparently they must have been aware of. I mean, they were worried about the Jews in verse 5. I don't remind you about them. They were worried about Sodom and Gomorrah. He talked about them, and they, they knew that. So obviously, they must be somebody that we know about. Some say, well, you know, these are the angels from the original fall of Satan. Now, if that's true, that means that they're all locked up, and they're not active in the world today. But we know the Bible teaches that there are a great host of fallen angels that we call, and the Bible refers to as demons, who are very active in the world today. Demons are real, all right? So they can't be those demons. It has to be something else. Uh, the third version is, uh, well, we know who they are, and, and the Bible tells us. So who are they? And what does the Bible say? How do we know who they are? Well, if he says there's somebody we should know about, we remember, let me remind you about these. 
And then he tells us, he kind of gives you a reference. He says there's three things about these angels. First of all, they don't keep their first estate. Keep their first estate. And the word keep here is, is a Greek word which means to keep vigilant watch over. We see that word a lot in the New Testament. Where it talks about watching and being on guard for the enemy and things like that. That these angels had a certain watch that they were responsible for. Doesn't tell us exactly what it is, but they were responsible. It says they didn't keep it. In fact, it calls that they didn't keep their first estate. Domain is the word here. Rule would be a better word in our English language. In other words, these angels had a specific responsibility over specific things, and they didn't do it. They walked away from it. They didn't do what God told them to do originally, and they walked away from it and said, no, we would rather do this. They kept not their first estate. Now, Maybe you don't understand, but angels do have positions. Even demons, the Bible talks about principalities and powers and rulers of wickedness in high places. There's even a, a structure to the demonic world. Obviously, God has a structure in his world. We know that God is, is a God of order. So there are certain angels with certain tasks. The Bible even talks about angels that are assigned to the saints. I probably have one, several because I'm sure they resign often, you know. <laughs> It's probably yours turn their letter of resignation in occasionally. Say, give me some help here. This guy's out of his mind. But anyway, these angels had a responsibility which they didn't guard and which they didn't keep. And it says they deliberately, the second thing is, they left their habitation. They walked out. Wherever that habitation was, in heaven, whatever domain it was, they just left it and said, no, we're not going to do that. And the third thing it says about him, it says they did like Sodom and Gomorrah did. King James Version puts verse 7 like this. He says here, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vigilance of eternal fire. So it tells us a little bit about what these angels did when they left their habitation. They did what the Sodomites and the Gomorrahites did. They went after strange flesh and gave themselves over to fornication. Angels giving themselves over to committing fornication. That's what the Bible says here. And by the way, you know, the Greek word for, for fornication is the word parnuo. This is a word which has to do with excessive fornication. It's called ekpornuo. It means excessively in this particular area of immorality. Just as the people of Sodom and Gomorrah gave themselves over to uh, immorality and homosexuality and all the sins that we know of Sodom and Gomorrah that characterize that, that, that city, it says these angels did the same thing. They went after, when it talks about strange flesh in the scripture in regard to the Sodomites, they write, in other words, it's a word which means different or other or not of the same kind. These Sodomites, if you read the story in Genesis, it says they lusted after the angels. Remember, the angels came to deliver Lot and his family. And the men of Sodom, and in fact, it says all the people of Sodom came out and surrounded Lot's house, tried to break in, you know, so they could sodomize and rape these angels that were there. I mean, this is, they, that's their desire. And ultimately, God struck them with blindness so that they couldn't see. And so they're groping about, even in their blindness, they're still trying to carry out their immorality. So just as Sodom went after angels, here the story is a little twisted in this way. It says that angels were going after men or after women. All right? They were pursuing them. Strange is the word heteros means different but of another kind. All right? I'm a heterosexual. All right? You got it? My, uh, my wife is the same, but she's a different kind of the same. <laughs> she's not the same. She's not homo. She's hetero. All right, so you understand where the terminology comes from and what it means. So here are these angels doing the same thing that Sodom and Gomorrah did. They're doing and committing themselves to fornication and lusting after human women. You say, where do, where do we get this at? Well, if you look in Genesis chapter 6, right prior to the flood, that you see this where the Bible talks about the sons of God, and I believe that's angels. We'll come back to it in a moment. It's kind of like wholesale Rosemary's baby. It says, and it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit will not strive with man forever, 
because he's also his flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they all bore children of them. These were mighty men who were of old and men of renown. In other words, there's, there's these creatures that were being born that were half demon and half man. It was a, it was a, and, and I believe this is the reason for the flood. Ultimately, besides the ultimate wickedness of man, is that this half-breed race had to be destroyed. Why? Because it was unredeemable. God is seeking to redeem humanity, and now you have this bizarre thing going on, obviously motivated by the demonic and obviously motivated by the devil to produce this unredeemable race. And so now the flood comes and destroys everyone on the planet but eight people. Just saves eight people. Now it's argued by some, and there's some different ideas in Matthew 22 where Jesus said, you know, there's no marrying and there's no giving in marriage in heaven as the angels don't marry and give in marriage. People say, well, you know, the angels don't marry in heaven. And others say, well, you know, uh, angels are sexless. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. In fact, when you study the scriptures, every angel you see that appears, appears in a man's body. I know that's going to mess up the, uh, the little uh, novelty shops. Where all the angels are always women. <laughs> I mean, you have a little collection of angels in your house. My wife, was, my wife has a little collection of angels, and you know, two thirds of them are women. You know, they're pretty. <laughs> but you know, when you see angels in Scripture, they always appear in a male form. As we understand it, angels take on a male body. Say, angels of themselves are not able to procreate, obviously, but they're able with women to procreate according to Scripture. It's bizarre, I know it, but it's just what the Bible says. I mean, what in the Bible is not bizarre? <laughs> God said and there was. That's pretty wild, isn't it? So this is wild and it's mysterious, but it's obviously something they're familiar with. They, the Scriptures are given them. They have the, the Torah, they have the Word of God, they have the books of Moses. They see this story. They see the flood of no, Moses here. And then you relate that to what Jude is saying. And obviously you're seeing something here about these angels. And the Bible is saying, you know, these angels who had every, every opportunity for fellowship with God rejected it and chose their own way and chose to do what they wanted to do which is the, the heartbeat of the apostate. So, and then he describes their, their judgment in verse, in verse 6. He starts talking about, you know, he's kept them in eternal bonds under darkness for the great day, or the, the judgment of the great day. He says they're, they're, they're kept in, in chains. So again, these angels are not roaming around like those that fell with Satan. And by the way, kept is the word in the, in the Greek language. The verb there for keeping is the word. It was done in the past. They've been locked up. But the idea is, a, is, a, is an active verb. In other words, they're still being locked up. They're kept in chains, done in the past with, with continued results. Kept under darkness. This deep darkness that they're hidden under till the day of the Lord. Remember when in 2 Peter 2, 4, and 5, you know, and he's talking about the end times and all those things, he points back to the flood. He said, God didn't spare the angels at sin. Peter mentions it as well as Jude. But he cast them into hell and delivered the chains of darkness to be, to be reserved unto judgment. So here we have these angels who are like the apostates, like the Jewish people became in that group in the wilderness. There was a whole group of them that were apostates. Not everybody went in, only those that believed. Not all the angels departed, many of them stayed. But here we have a third illustration, and he uses that, the illustration of Sodom and Gomorrah. Whatever the angels did, Sodom and Gomorrah did the same. They knew the truth. But they rejected the truth. You say, well, well aren't, the, aren't the, the, uh, the Sodomites and the Gomorites, aren't they, aren't they really, you know, uh, Gentiles? They are. Let me go back to this where he talked about in, in Genesis 6 when he talked about the sons of God. What makes us think that those are angels? Well, Job says it came to pass on the day when the sons of God came to present themselves before Jehovah, that Satan also came among them. He's referring to the angels as they stand before God and giving account for what their responsibilities might be. And, and uh, also in, in Job chapter 2, it came to pass on the day when the sons of God came to present themselves before Jehovah, that Satan came along with them to present himself before Jehovah. Job, later in the, the book, verse uh, 7 of chapter 38, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. These are references. In fact, the old Septuagint uh, recorded before we had our Bible, you know, records this word, you know, the Greek Septuagint, the Old Testament word angel is always used. In fact, there's really only one place in the Old Testament that makes a reference to the sons of God that's not angels. 
and it becomes very clear that it's not angels for the way it's written in it. When in Hosea chapter 1, verse 10, he says, we're the sons of God, and he talks about the nation of Israel, and how he's referring to the family of God's people who have trusted him, and who believed him, and he calls them, they're the sons of God. The Bible talks about us in the context of the New Testament, that Jesus Christ, was given up as God's sacrifice. God sacrificed His Son that He might bring many sons. So we are the children of God as well. But in regard to this, this illustration of them, the sons of God was, was the angels. Now let's get on to the, the Sodom and Gomorrah issue. Remember we said that to know the truth and reject it. You say, well, uh, you know, what did, the, what did they know? Well, the apostate knows the truth and chooses not to receive it. This is only about 450 years after the flood, the incident with Sodom and Gomorrah. 450 years later, you say, well, how could they know the truth? Well, at least one of Noah's sons was alive, all right? And we have the word of God. And so he knew well the testimony of what happened, and he gave it to them. So they knew the message. If not, maybe probably even available through Lot, Abraham's nephew, who would be able to give them the truth. But they didn't want the truth. They came. In fact, God had given them opportunities. You see, before God cursed the Chaldeans and ran them out. We see in the Old Testament, even through Jonah, where God gave those people opportunities to repent and to get right with God, but they rejected the truth. The Bible says that God has made himself known, so much so. You talk about with the children of Israel and miracles and everything. It says everybody, that God has made himself known so much so that even the creation itself declares there's a God. John chapter 1 says, God lights every man who comes into the earth. Everybody that's born, the light comes on. Somewhere in their life, God will bring some light. God's going to show them there's light. He's going to show them there's a God. And if they respond to light, he'll lead them to the truth. But a lot of people, they don't want light. The Bible says that men love darkness because their deeds are evil. If I get in the light, then I can see where I'm at. That's why some people don't like believers' fellowship, because we got a lot of light being preached, all right? So we're always preaching truth, which is the light of the Word of God. So when the lights come on, they say, oh, they don't like this too bright. And they go somewhere else. I want to be known as a, as a word church, a word person, a word people, amen, that we stand for truth. And we preach the whole counsel of the Word of God, not just that which is sweet, and, and, but all of it. So these people, they reject the truth. Romans chapter 1, it says, but well, the day's coming, and really here, that people will be given light. All this testimony of God will be given to them, but because they love their darkness, because they don't want light, that they will reject the truth of God's Word. In Romans 1, if you follow it through, it says, God reveals himself to man, Man rejects God. Man wants to worship himself. He ultimately turns to sins of, of sodomy, the sins of Gomorrah. He talks about the, 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 the homosexuality in Romans chapter 1. And basically showing the culture under judgment. What happens? When we reject God, then nothing's sacred anymore. We can do with ourselves. We're not sacred anymore. All right? So we'll do with our bodies whatever we want to do. We'll do with our lives whatever we want to do. Because nothing's sacred if there is no God. Men reject the truth. Men do not accept the truth. They turn to darkness. And ultimately, it says, that leads to that kind of immorality because what we believe ultimately dictates our philosophy, all right? What, what I really believe in my heart is the way I'm going to live. That's why a lot of people they get involved in sin and say, well, I don't believe that anymore. And they change the truth of God into a lie. Or they do what many theologians do today. They say, oh, that's not what the Bible means. Or that was Paul or that was Peter, or that was somebody else, but that's not what the Bible means today. And what the Bible means today is different. And listening to an apostate teacher on the radio or on the, on, on the internet this week, and he was talking about uh, the, the, the miracle where Jesus is on the water, you know, and, the, and Peter gets out of the boat, and uh, Peter sunk, and he says, you know, I've read that story in my life, and this is a, a well-known preacher up in the Chicago area, a, many, a very large church. And he says, you know, <clears throat> I was uh, reading that story, and it really came to me what that means. He said, when Peter got out of the boat and failed, it wasn't because he didn't have faith in Christ at that moment, and he started looking at the winds and waves. The truth is, and I had this revelation, is that he didn't have faith in himself. And that's why he sunk. That is, that is nowhere near what the Bible teaches. In fact, the Bible teaches just that don't have faith in yourself, trust God. That everything else is vanity, that you can't trust yourself to save yourself. You'll deceive yourself, you'll delude yourself, you'll mislead yourself because you have the nature of a sinner. And you need to be changed and transformed in your nature so that God can do something miraculous within you. 
which changes you. That's the power of God's word. So he says, it's just faith in yourself. That's and if Peter had more faith in himself, he could have walked on that water. Like, it's, like what we need is confidence. It's apostasy. That's where it's going today. That's why there's perversion of scripture and rejection of truth. Basically, the, the message is very clear from the word of God. If you put your faith in anything else, you're going to sink. Because there's only one you can put your faith in that is master over all things. He's the Lord over all things. He conquered death. He's conquered hell. He's conquered Satan. Every enemy that you could possibly have in your life, Jesus faced it on your behalf, and it has been conquered. <laughs> Sodom and Gomorrah, we know their sin. Even though there are those who try to tell you that the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah was not homosexuality, the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was inhospitality. That's, that's the popular teaching. They just didn't treat the angels with manners. That they were rude to them. I guess trying to be rape them is considered rude, I guess so. <laughs> they were not hospitable, so God judged them for their inhospitality. See, this is where we've gone as a culture and as a world. We just, you know, we want to justify all ourselves and all our sins and everything. But it, it, the Bible, 23 places, it alludes to the judgment that took place in Sodom and Gomorrah and why God judged it. There were some of God's people in Sodom and Gomorrah, so God seeks to deliver them. This is the most profound story of judgment in, in, in Scripture basically, that you can look at and see it and even verify today that there was cities of Sodom and Gomorrah that were destroyed by brimstone. Once well, archaeologists that have researched this and gone to that area and looked at the, the southern end of the Dead Sea, they see what happened, which is right near where Sodom and Gomorrah was. The archaeologists say there was a great rupture in the strata at one point. Like there was this subterranean pool of oil that literally on the south shore that ignited, that resulted in a blast that lifted up the whole section of the valley floor in the air and large quantities of sulfur and oil and, 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 and salt just blanketed the whole area, which we see Lot's wife, a salt pillar divinely directed at her. She was looking back. These are three historic illustrations, folks, of apostasy. Listen to what the scripture says. If any man love not the Lord Jesus, let him be anathema. Maranatha. Maranatha means come quickly, Lord Jesus. Let me give to you a New American Standard. If anyone doesn't love the Lord, let him be accursed. That's what the word anathema means. And by the way, it's not that I'm cursing anybody or you're cursing anybody and putting me, we're judging me. And I get so sick and tired. Well, you're just judging me. I'm just telling you what's written. I'm not, I don't have any power to judge. The only one I can judge is me, all right? I can judge myself and look at myself, make decisions, make corrections and respond to them, all right? Or not. Judgment has already been settled. And we talked about the judgment that was ordained. In other words, the wages of sin is death. That's just period. That's it. That's like the law of gravity. You jump off the building, you're going to fall. All right? Unless you're wearing, you know, some kind of rocket, then that law of aerodynamics will override the law of gravity. The only way you're going to override the law of judgment is the law of grace. Amen. You get strapped into Jesus. And it, it, you know, but there's, you have to live with it as a Christian of being con Confused with, I mean, people are not going to understand you in the days that you live in, and you've probably already gotten it. Well, you're just intolerant. You just got to be tolerant. Listen, I'm the most tolerant guy in the world. All right? I put up with you, you put up with me. That's a lot of tolerance there. Amen? We don't always agree, but we, you know, hey, I'm tolerant with Buddhists. I'm tolerant with, you know, Islamists. I'm, I'm tolerant with Jehovah Witness. You know, I, I don't have to be intolerant with them. God's going to take care of them. I can do my own thing. Amen? I'm tolerant. But that word doesn't mean what it used to mean in our culture. So what it used to mean is that, hey, you know, we're in America, we can respect each other, and if that's the way you choose to live, then you can choose to live the way, but I still have the right to say what I believe is the truth. Now, tolerance doesn't mean that anymore. That doesn't mean anywhere near that anymore in the culture you live in. Now, tolerance means this. Okay, here's what we say tolerance means. Everybody's the same, everybody's equal. So if you're a heterosexual or homosexual, it doesn't matter if things are Or if you're a Buddhist or an Islamist, it's all right. If you're a Christian or a you know, Jew, or if you're this or that, it's, just, it's all the same. But let me tell you something. There's one thing that the Bible says is not the same, and that is the gospel, that is Christianity. That's why this letter starts out, earnestly contend for the faith that was once for all delivered. So I'm saying that, hey, I can tolerate false religions. All right, God's going to deal with it. 
But if I say that, they say, no, you're not tolerant, because if you were tolerant, then you would believe that false religions were the same as your religion. That everybody's the same. So if I say it's not, and if I say that this is sin and this is right, then now you can accuse me of hate crimes. Then now I'm intolerant. Then now I'm judgmental. Then now, that's what tolerant means in the new culture, the new age we're living in. Everybody's the same. If you say anything, oh, you're a threat to society. That's why in Canada today, if you're an evangelical preacher and you say something against sodomy and against homosexuality, you're considered preaching hate crime. And we can put you in jail. It's that way in Europe, areas of Europe, and it soon will be coming to a church near you. I, I told you that two, three years ago to get ready that the, the courts, the Supreme Courts, were soon going to announce that, hey, homosexuality and the marriage of a homosexual human is equally acceptable in laws as the marriage between heterosexual couples. That's where, it's, that's where now states all across America have done it, and pretty soon the United States Supreme Court is going to say the same thing. That's where it's all headed. You don't have to listen to the news very long to see this is the truth of what I'm saying. It's like the Christian couple in the news just this last week who uh, they have Christian photography, they do marriages, and this homosexual couple said, we want you to uh, take photographs of our union. They didn't call it a marriage because it was illegal in that state. And they denied it and said, no, you know, we're Christians and we, we, we don't believe in that lifestyle. They sued them and won the case. The judge over the case said, you know, that, you know, that just shows these people have respect for other people. And that it's their obligation as citizens to treat everyone equally. Whatever happened to my right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? <laughs> it's got to coincide with your right to life, liberty. So this is where we've gone, and this is why the apostle is saying, you need to understand these truths, you need to understand what's happening in the culture you live in, because ultimately, if we consider the course, if we stay on the course, and by the way, we will, because the Bible says we will, then you and I are in some deep trouble. And you just need to be ready for it. Amen. Don't get mad. Get glad Jesus is coming. It's just the way it's going to be. And that's why some people will turn back because they don't say, I don't, I don't want that kind of heat. I don't want those kind of problems. I don't be around those kind of people. Listen, you say, you know, well, that's just this judgment stuff. That's just you Christian. That, that's, just, that's just saying a whole lot. I mean, if you just believe God's going to judge everybody, God's love, whatever God's love. God, just, I can't believe you guys just say judgment and hell and condemnation and all that stuff. You just preach that, that junk, man, and just make people unhappy and miserable. That just, you know, hey, let me get you something that you don't quite get if that's what you're saying. You don't quite get that God sent his only begotten son so that you would not have to suffer condemnation. The Bible says, Jesus, out of his own lips, says, you're already condemned. John chapter 3, go read it. You're already condemned. If you don't believe in me, if you don't trust in me, if you don't believe God, then you're condemned already. He said, but he that believeth not is condemned, but he that believeth is not condemned. Simply, if you choose to put your faith in Christ, you're not condemned. You say, well, condemnation, that's hard. What's hard? You tell me what's hard. Let's visit heaven during the crucifixion to see what's hard. Let's see God giving up his own son to die on the cross, the brutal death that he died for you and for me so that we could have life, so that we could have this choice, so we could be given this option for life instead of death, for peace instead of judgment. Amen. It costs God everything. There's a way. There's a truth. There's a life. And it's found in Jesus Christ. To reject that is to reject hope. Hope. Only man in the whole of the cosmos, in all the so-called great religions of the world, there's only one of them that says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one covers the Father but by me. And it was Jesus. Now, he was either a liar or a madman. Or he's telling the truth. I believe he's telling the truth. So how do you know? The transformation that God did in my heart, there's no other explanation. Nor will there be in your life any other explanation than God did something in you. Don't settle for religion. Don't settle for just being Baptist or Catholic or Methodist or whatever it might be. Settle on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Settle on nothing less than the cross. Stake your claim on Jesus Christ. Say, I do believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And that no man can come to the Father by him. So I'm going with him because that's the way to the Father. Would you stand with your heads bowed?